Good afternoon. I'm Hobson Woolenthal, the provost of the University of Texas at Dallas, and it's my uh, pleasure and my privilege to welcome you to our campus today. Uh, it's, it's a privilege to be representing the Ackerman Center for Holocaust Studies and to uh, be one of the hosts for this year's Burton C. Einsbruck Lecture on the Holocaust. Uh, Many of you I know are very familiar with our university and our Holocaust Studies program. I hope some of you are newcomers because we, we always want to uh, have our circle of friends and supporters enlarge. But uh, for those of you who might be somewhat strange to the University of Texas at Dallas, I uh, want to note that our Ackerman Center uh, for Holocaust Studies and our Holocaust Studies faculty and courses are one of the highlights of our great university. Uh, we carry out research on the Holocaust. Uh, we teach future teachers of the Holocaust and we bring to our great undergraduate student body uh, fundamental scientific knowledge about the Holocaust and, and many undergraduate classes. And uh, collectively, it's one of the, uh, the star programs at our university, and we're very proud of it. Um, I want to make a little interruption in our program that you have with you, and I'd like to call the person who, for whom the lecture series is named and the person who made it happen uh, Dr. Burton Einstruck to make a, just a short remark. Bert. Thank you, Hobson. I appreciate everyone who's come here. And I wanted to say just a word about Helma Ackerman, who just passed away. Uh, Helma had uh, two black stars in her life. First of all, being born in occupied Holland in 1942. Not a good place for a person considered Jewish. The other black star was at the end of her life where she had metastatic cancer of the lung, excruciating death. But Helma was a very resilient, resourceful, contrarian, and she fought every minute of the way with a stubborn Dutch quality. So let's give a thought about Helma and move on to the good part of the, the lecture. Good afternoon. My name is Sally Belofsky, and I have the honor of uh, serving as chairman of the board of the advisory board for the Holocaust Studies program here at UT Dallas. Um, I know you're here to to listen to the words of Jan Gross. We're honored to have him back. He was here 12 years ago. Uh, time really goes by quickly, but 12 years have seen so many major, major changes up here at the university with the Holocaust Studies program. But 12 years ago, we had one professor, Professor Ashvath, teaching one or two courses. And today, we have three endowed professors teaching 16 courses a year to over 400 students. And in addition, we have the uh, Ackerman Center, which is a, a beautiful facility for the students uh, to study, to do their research, to meet with the, the professors. So we've comp accomplished a whole lot uh, in 12 years, and we're honored to have Jan Gross back with us. Personally, I've never been invited back. Wherever I've gone, I've never gotten an invitation. <laughs> but, so I know, I know that's an important thing. So, uh, but it's my honor now to introduce uh, Professor Ashvath, who uh, is the founder of this Holocaust Studies program. She is still the heart and soul of the program, and I'm calling on her to introduce Professor Gross. Juji Ashvath. It's an interesting way of saying I am the founder of the program. <laughs> I, was, I was teaching the Holocaust from the beginning that I got to UTD and had the luck to do, do, to do so. 
So, and then what developed is really the work of my colleagues and, um, of course, um, Dr. Wildenthal, whose um, kindness and, and whose helpfulness and whose interest in the Holocaust is basically that has created this entire program. Um, of course, also, uh, Dr. Einspruch has a lot to do with that, what happens today. Um, and I am incredibly grateful to him, as well as we all are. So I am here really to introduce Professor Gross to you, who is one of the major Holocaust scholars of our time. He has changed. It's very difficult to explain the incredible significance of that change. I think he will be, of course, doing that in this lecture. Uh, but he won't emphasize exactly the word change, what he has achieved throughout these years that his books, three major books, appeared on the Holocaust in Poland. He changed Polish opinion. He created a world in which it was possible to study and speak and think about the Holocaust in ways in which it happened and to try to find out more about it. So um, I don't want to take away more time. I just would like to tell you the incredible significance and I, of this event and of this deed. And I would very much like you to go, if possible, and buy some of these books, because you, if you start reading them, you understand this absolutely shaping significance that his works have created. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, the um, invitation to come back, first of all. This is, I'm very proud and uh, uh, happy that I can, uh, can be here again. And uh, I'm, I'm deeply grateful also for, uh, for kind words that Professor Oswald just uh, uh, shared with you <clears throat> about my work. So uh, without further ado, let me just Mm, plunge into the substance of, of my talk today on uh, the story of in the periphery of the Holocaust really an opportunistic killings and plunder of Jews in Poland by their neighbors. I would like to shed light in this lecture on the phenomenon of killings and plunder of Jews by local people in German-occupied Poland crimes which occurred on the periphery of the Holocaust. In terms of numbers of Jewish victims, this was only a small fraction of the total killed by the Nazis. In terms of numbers, in, in the, the loot that remained in local hands, not equally insignificant, primarily because of the housing stock which was taken over by local residents, was also only a tiny part of the Jewish wealth that had been plundered during World War II. But as mysteries pertaining to the Holocaust abound, these marginal phenomena, adversarial interaction between Jews and their fellow citizens in occupied societies, had been catapulted decades later into the center of preoccupation for national historiographies. They have attracted extraordinary public interest, both in Eastern and in Western Europe. So a marginal issue in the historiography of the Shoah turned into a sticky one, judging by public and professional attention, not letting go of easily as far as European societies under occupation are concerned. To address this subject, one needs to connect, to contend with yet another sort of marginality, due to the fact that the information provided by Jews about the fate they suffered during the war has often been viewed with incredulity. 
What I am referring to in the first place was a perverse consequence of unbelievable radicalism of anti-Jewish policies pursued by the Nazis. This belief, I'm quoting now from an essay by Jeffrey Hartman, a renowned literary scholar who as a child emigrated from Germany. This belief touched the survivors themselves. Two phrases stand out in their testimony. I was there and I could not believe what my eyes had seen. The second phrase is not purely rhetorical. Appelfeld, whom Hartmann quotes, writes, everything that happened was so gigantic, so inconceivable, that the witness even seemed like a fabricator to himself, unquote. I can testify to this bafflement with the outsized scale of Holocaust events as reported by witnesses from personal experience. It took me four years and a pure lucky coincidence to realize that the testimony of one Schmuel Wasserstein who described the crime in Jedwabne, the subject of my book, Neighbors, was not an exaggeration, but a pretty faithful description of what had happened. Another reason for doubting information about the unfolding catastrophe of European Jews was a long-lasting memory of Allied propaganda hoax dating back to the First World War. At the time, tales of German atrocities allegedly committed against the civilian population, especially in Belgium, were grossly exaggerated. Consequently, reports of mass murder coming out of occupied Europe 20 years later were still viewed with caution by journalists and government officials in England and in the United States. When we add to this a generally demeaning stereotype of Jews in Christian cultural tradition, we can appreciate why Jewish sources were a priori treated with deep ambivalence. The French-Israeli historian René Poznański describes, for example, a generalized skepticism of high functionaries of the Foreign Office. As a general principle, she characterizes, using their own words, the state of mind in British government circles, Jews have a tendency to exaggerate the severity of persecution to which they are subjected, unquote. A weighty point of view when held by those who control the most important propaganda vehicle broadcasting into occupied Europe, the BBC. In order to ensure the effectiveness of war propaganda, their concern was not to exaggerate any claims, and especially those pertaining to the persecution of Jews. The latter, in order not to give plausibility to a German argument that the war was being waged by the Allies on behalf and in the interest of the Jews. From East to West, from the Gaullist France Libre broadcasts to radio programs authorized by General Sikorsky's Polish government in exile, both de Gaulle and Sikorsky were self-exiled at the time in England, those trying to beef up anti-Nazi resistance in their home countries were anxious not to emphasize the victimization of the Jews, lest they render plausible the Nazi arguments that Jews were pulling all the strings in London and in America. It mattered also that the predominant mood of public opinion in countries under occupation was anti-Semitic. There should not be any privileged victims in France, and discretion in Jewish matters is advised. General de Gaulle's Free France movement was warned by its rapporteurs from across the Channel. The Polish Prime Minister, General Władysław Sikorski, was bluntly told by his underground commanders that he should cut expressions of sympathy for the Jews from radio broadcasts because they made a bad impression in Poland. Pace idiosyncratic views of the British Foreign Office or reasons why the plight of the Jews was de-emphasized in European countries under occupation. As far as the Anglo-Saxon study of the war is concerned, the original direct culprit may have been none other than Raoul Hilberg, the doyen of Holocaust historiography. We are all indebted to him and will be forever standing on his shoulders, but he dismissed victims' personal narratives as unreliable and, from his point of view, irrelevant. Hilberg was interested, as was his ride, in the German machinery of mass murder. And he did show, indeed, how its functioning can be 
pierced together uh, from documentation generated by institutional participants in the process. And once the subject opened up, historians for some time were primarily interested in the perpetrators. Naturally, a story to be dug up in the German archives rather than in memoirs of surviving Jews. So what can historians do with individual testimonies? Other things being equal, even though they never are, the problem of availing ourselves of testimony of eyewitnessed account about the Holocaust derives, it seems to me, from processing the evidence according to ordinary procedures and linguistic usage of categories employed. When we take in hand an eyewitness account of a Holocaust victim, we place it mentally in a familiar context. We read it as a statement from an injured party. There is a victim and a victimizer in a scenario, and we hear in the narrative the victim's side of the story, presumably one side of the story. And when there are sides, or if you will, parties to a conflict, then we expect to hear from one party only partial truth. It takes a moment and a prise de conscience to realize that the vocabulary we employ, victim, testimony, or witness, puts a deceptive frame on our thinking. The semantic hereditary, heredity of such concepts le leads us astray because there is no advocacy in the narratives of Holocaust victims. I know that we should not naively accept an author's stated intentions as the one and only guide to the reading of a text, but they should not be discarded out of hand either. We must remember, therefore, that Jewish testimonies about the Shoah have been deliberately written in order to provide an exact account of the catastrophe. This is evidenced in numerous memoirs and journals kept by Jews at the time. The same intention informed collective efforts, such as the Onek Shabbat initiative by Emanuel Ringelblum in the Warsaw Ghetto, the daunting work of the archivists from the ghetto in Kovno, or Hermann Kruk's diaries and records compiled in Vilno. Since it appeared impossible to save the mass of Jewish people methodically annihilated in the Nazi-organized killing process, a sense of obligation grew among the Jewish record keepers, they say so explicitly and repeatedly, to at least preserve the evidence of the very process of destruction. Thus revealed, future readers cannot dismiss authors' intentions lightly. Clearly, their aim was to produce an account of what happened, not to embellish the story. If anything, the record keeper's difficulty was the reverse. The reality surrounding them was such an exaggeration of everything people were accustomed to in the course of everyday life, that their concern could only be whether posterity would be capable of believing in what had really happened, the record, as it were. In virtually all Holocaust-era diaries, detailed, unique, specific to the place, and reflecting the vagaries of each author's individual destiny, one finds a common theme, a recurring line. Whatever we may have foreseen and written about many times, I'm quoting now by way of example from Hermann Kruk's entry of October 28, 1942, and I continue quoting, it is all hardly a fraction of the actual situation. Unquote. One cannot grapple with the surrounding reality, all diaries seem to be saying. It cannot be communicated fully. Holocaust memoirists labored against enormous odds, most strikingly against their own incredulity at what was happening around them. Their predicament was bewildering. Nobody will believe us if we say it how it was, and yet we can at best only tell a fraction of what has actually happened. Did they have any need or inducement to exaggerate or embellish their narratives? I think not. Rather, their one and only ultimate satisfaction, a hopeless task, we know, could come from being able to say to themselves as readers of what they have left us, yes, that's exactly what happened. They left carefully crafted, deliberately assembled meaningful documents of the epoch which deserve to be treated as such. And in order to make sense of our century's dark times, 
We should read their testimony as it was conceived, one line at a time. Personal, personal testimonies may have finally entered the mainstream of Holocaust historiography with the most recent grand synthesis, Scholl Friedlander's The Years of Extermination, published in 2007, where the author draws on such material abundantly. Christopher Browning has published in 2010 a similarly grounded study of a forced labor camp in Starachowice, as did Yehuda Bauer in his Death of the Shtetl. And Omer Bartov is completing his book on communal genocide in Buchach. With giants in the field, drawing freely on personal testimonies of Holocaust victims and survivors, historiographical standards are shifting. But so far, it has been a struggle to fend off criticisms which easily dismissed writing on the basis of personal documents as not properly grounded and providing merely anecdotal evidence. In the meantime, for an entire spectrum of interesting subjects, the fate of Jews hiding on the so-called Aryan side or resistance in provincial ghettos, for example, almost no other empirical evidence is available. The task before us then is to figure out how to obtain a reliable understanding of a general phenomenon, in my case, killings and plunder of Polish Jews by their fellow citizens, on the basis of personal statements, which by their very nature offer only episodic and discrete information. Ever since the story of the murder in Jedwabne was debated in Poland 13 years ago, historians of the Holocaust began to study court cases prosecuted after the war on the basis of the August 31st, 1944 decree of the provisional Polish government. It is customary to refer to them now in a shorthand as the so-called August cases. The decree provided for criminalization of broadly conceived aid and assistance furthering German occupiers' goals to the detriment of the Polish society. Occasionally, the murder of Jews was prosecuted under this law as well. Some two decades after the war, all the August cases from court districts around the country were conveniently assembled in one archival collection under the custody of the main commission for investigation of Hitlerite crimes. Today, they are in the holdings of the Institute of National Memory. I will draw here on a very useful contribution of two historians who examined all the August cases in the Kielce Voivodeship containing evidence about murders of Jews by the Poles in the countryside of this region. Altogether, about 250 people were brought to justice there for the alleged involvement in the murder of several hundred Jews. The authors, Alina Skibinska and Jakub Petelewicz, complemented their knowledge acquired from archival readings with interviews conducted in the area. A historian of the Holocaust would know right away that this is a source revealing only a tip of the iceberg of the phenomenon under study, partly due to a reluctance of prosecutorial authorities after the war to bring such cases to court. But most importantly, this is a body of evidence from which Jewish voices are almost entirely absent. These were not cases brought by Jews. The Jews that appear in these depositions were killed and there were no Jewish witnesses left to testify about the killings either. On the other hand, this material, even though affording us only a partial insight, represents the entire collection of a certain kind of evidence bearing on the issue. So, with respect to it, we cannot be accused of a sample bias. By itself, this does not necessarily allow to obtain a reliable general portrait of what happened, one would still have to know about the ecology of the crime to make sure that all murder episodes have not clustered in some small sub-region of the area, for example, or if the entire region can be considered typical, so to speak, with respect to this kind of crime and similar to the rest of Poland. To allay doubts on this last point, let me mention a recent study of another voivodeship, Rzeszow Szczyzna, where murders of Jews by local Poles are documented in at least 110 locations. In any case, with these caveats in mind, taking all of the evidence of a particular kind under consideration is always a good practice. We need to focus now on what is at stake here and what kind of question we are bringing to the evidence at our disposal. 
Essentially, we want to adjudicate between two interpretations of the phenomenon of murder and plunder of Jews by their fellow Polish citizens during the war. One interpretation would simply claim that stuff happens. People get killed during the war, there was a lot of violence all around and so it got privatized at times, banditry was rampant, people lost their moral bearings, there is always scum in a society and anyway, one should not generalize on the basis of isolated cases. In short, this was deviant behavior. Or else, it wasn't. And in order to find out, I suggest that we must read the content of the cases to learn what actually happened and make sense of it. I'm now going to quote extensively from the above mentioned article describing numerous murders of Jews hiding in the Kielce countryside by the Polish population. I spliced together fragments of text scattered over several pages in a continuous narrative. I begin the quote. Killings by shooting with an axe or using a wooden pole were accompanied by acts of physical and psychological cruelty towards Jews who had been caught. Women were raped. People were beaten, pushed around, cursed at, and verbally humiliated. The accused, the alleged perpetrators of crimes against the Jews, were peasants, Polish so-called dark blue policemen from outposts closest to the site of murder, members of various guerrilla organizations who frequently were the very peasants living during the day in their villages rather than staying in forest detachments. In very many cases, the accused held some position or function in the local officialdom. Village heads, deputy village heads, district heads, employees of district office, members and commanders of local fire brigades, uh, they were, without exception of Roman Catholic denomination, grown-up men, in general, without a prior criminal record. They had stable family life, wives and children. Some of them were members of the Communist Party or work in the People's Militia, the police force, after the war. Remember, these are data culled from trials that were held after the war, so we know a little bit about their biographies, also how they continued after the war. By virtue of their functions, at least a part of them belong to the local elite in the countryside. I'm still continuing to quote. Women had often witnessed and observed what had happened. They belonged to passive crowds, which carried the killings with the hands of a few of their most active participants. One could even venture a proposition based on depositions from witnesses and the accused that there were many active participants and observers in almost each of these crimes. As far as murders perpetrated in villages, we can even speak about an aggressive criminal crowd where a few people play an initiating and leading role while everybody else, by witnessing their crime, provide at the same time a background and a moral alibi for the crime committed. In a certain sense, the entire village takes part in it with a different degree of involvement or witnessing, and after the war, the entire village keeps in its collective unconscious and memory events which then took place with its participation. This anonymous crowd constitutes an extremely important element for the analysis of this phenomenon. Its presence allows to diffuse responsibility for the crimes committed, and in a certain sense, silently gives permission to do what had been done to the Jews. I'm still quoting. In numerous files, we read detailed descriptions of the crimes during which victims and perpetrators talked to each other. Jews defended themselves, begged and appealed to the conscience and pity of the killers. After this man was killed, this little boy stood up and said to everybody present, Poles, spare my life. I am not guilty of anything. It is my misfortune that I am a Jew. They tried to bribe the perpetrators with what they still had and thus save their lives. We were playing cards when somebody dropped in and said that the Jew had been caught. I went outdoors. In front of the house to the group of people and Moshek begged to be let go. He was with his little son and they cried. This little Jew said, give them boots, daddy. Maybe they let us go. I'm still quoting. 
Crimes were perpetrated against individuals known, often by name, against neighbors, against local folks. A special category of perpetrators were the functionaries of the Polish dark blue police, in their majority, pre-war employees of the state police. Policemen implicated in crimes against the Jews were heads of families, typically with several children at home. Their material status was usually rather good. In their actions against the Jewish population, one can notice a large element of freedom and independence from superior German authority. In the cases at hand, there was not a single instance in which apprehended Jews were escorted back to a ghetto or to a police station, which would also mean death for them. They are usually killed right away or in a neighboring forest and local peasants are ordered to bury the corpses. The direct motive to commit the majority of murders and denunciations of Jews hiding in the countryside was the desire to plunder them, to take over their belongings, which were imagined to be considerable. This was a pernicious consequence of a stereotype about Jewish wealth. Peasants imagined that by killing these people, they will get hold of their riches. One should suppose that in a psychological sense, the fact that hiding Jews were paying for shelter and food, and often very high prices by local standards, reinforced the belief that they have lots of money, which can be taken from them with impunity. Indirectly, the same motif underlay murders of Jews who no longer could pay off those giving them shelter. People were getting rid of them, just as they were getting rid of Jews who had witnessed crimes committed earlier. In over a dozen closely researched cases, there is mention of characteristic and telling facts which accompanied the cry. After having finished, peasants gathered in the apartment of one of the participants to drink vodka, as if to celebrate with a meal their joint deed, to divide the spoils, and probably also to decompress. I'm quoting this very long quote. The above summary does not represent my reading of the evidence from the files of August cases tried in the Kielce District Court. It has been provided by two young Polish historians. It offers a composite image, and all the enumerated elements certainly could not be found in every episode they took under scrutiny. But it is nevertheless abundantly clear that any concept of deviance would have to be stretched beyond capacity to encompass the kind of behavior that Skibinska and Petelevich have described. Instead, we can note multiple ways in which killings of Jews by peasants in the Kielce countryside were socially sanctioned. Regular members of the community took part in them, not miscreants or marginal people easily identifiable in rural society. Indeed, the local elite's participation bestowed upon these crimes a kind of official imprimatur. Killings were carried out openly, often publicly, drawing crowds of onlookers. Direct perpetrators of these crimes, the most active participants, as far as one can tell, remained members of local communities in good standing. As was mentioned earlier, some joined the Communist Party and the People's Militia after the war. In almost every file, there are group affidavits signed by inhabitants of the village where murder, uh, where murder took place, vouching for the good and honorable character of the accused. This is proof, Skibinska and Petelevich observe, and I quote them, that the village was in solidarity with the accused and that in the consciousness of the inhabitants, there was no need to prosecute or to expiate in any way for the crime, unquote. In the conclusion of their article, the authors finally draw on interviews they conducted in the region six years after the events. They note an almost total lack of interest in the fate of murdered Jews, and that, and I quote them, if any emotion could be found in conversations, it was a disapproval directed towards the victim, unquote. Given the deep religiosity of the peasants, they wonder why obligations vis-a-vis -vis other human beings derived from Christian ethics were never invoked. A close reading of Skibinska's and Petelevich's study makes us wonder whether the question how many Jews had been killed by the local population in Poland is the right one to ask in order to find a proper measure of this most tragic aspect of Polish-Jewish relations during the war. Shouldn't we be asking instead how many murderers of Jews and their accomplices there were among the Poles? Because, to quote an American legal scholar, and I quote him now, open criminality implicates 
all who know of the contact and fail to act, unquote. One Jew killed by one direct perpetrator, but in a public manner, with approval and encouragement of a crowd of onlookers, represents a collective deed implicating all those present, a group experience of ultimate transgression marking forever a local community where it took place, if only because local people had to live from now on side by side with the murderers. What renders the study of the Holocaust so frustrating is its facelessness. The scandalous anonymity of victims unrecognized in their individuality at the moment of death, which every society marks with a solemn ritual, even for the lowliest and poorest. If I may paraphrase a well-known saying, to invoke a million people gassed at Auschwitz is tantamount to just quoting a number. But such is the nature of the subject and the evidence at our disposal that in writing Holocaust history, references to staggering numbers of victims cannot be avoided. Nonetheless, we yearn to pierce the oblivion to which this relegates individual victims, if only because violent death which had been inflicted upon them is by nature an intimate and personal experience. Confined to abstractions, we would not understand what had happened and our account of the Holocaust would not be truthful. Because at the risk of saying the obvious, actual people were killed in this man-made calamity and actual people carried out the killings. And it is at the periphery of the Holocaust that we come across the most abundant evidence personalizing what happened when killings of Jews were carried out by their Christian neighbors. In the study about Eichmann and his men, an Austrian historian called his protagonists not bureaucrats, but pathfinders. In fact, this observation applies to all Nazi perpetrators of the Holocaust in positions of authority over the Jews, since there was no ready blueprint, no bureaucratic routine to latch onto, and everything was fluid in their enterprise. A felicitous phrase coined by Jan Kershaw to characterize the overall functioning of the Nazi system, that following cues emanating from the top of the hierarchy rather than strict instructions, functionaries of the regime were working towards the Führer, fits admirably as a description of the mechanism of the final solution. No matter how large or small the domain over which they presided, a work detail, a barrack, a ghetto, or a camp, the men in charge of solving the Jewish question were improvisers. Notwithstanding Raoul Hilberg's painstaking recognition of bureaucratic coordination required to mobilize resources of a modern state to kill millions of Jews, very much the key aspect of what had happened, at the core of the process lay improvisation. It is a point, incidentally, that Hilberg explicitly acknowledges in Claude Landsmann's Shoah. Of course, bureaucratic capacity as well as technology of a modern state were necessary to carry out in a timely fashion the mass murder of widely dispersed millions of people. But bureaucratic apparati and bureaucratic routines are devised with specific goals in mind. And to apply them to different tasks requires adaptation, in other words, special initiative. To put it in the simplest terms, trains carrying Jews to death camps, again so instructively discussed by Hilberg and Shoah, were not operating according to a regular schedule. These were specially chartered trains, and somebody had to request them and steer them all the way through the maze of regular traffic. And so they could have been ordered or not, there could have been more or less of them, they could have been moved faster or slower through regular traffic, and so it goes for virtually every aspect of the killing process. At every stage of the Holocaust, decisions had to be made. It is a phenomenon filled with individual initiatives of the perpetrators, who are not simply cogs in a machine operating according to preordained rules. Far from it. And what this means is that agency in the Shoah to a degree we perhaps have not yet adequately recognized when thinking and writing about it, rests with a multitude of concrete individuals. Many people pushed the process along on their own initiative, and there were, ipso facto, many choke points where the process could have been slowed down, derailed, even temporarily halted. 
And this was not, and this was a, a significant and viable alternative because from a certain point on, it became clear that the Nazis were going to lose the war. To say, therefore, that nothing could have been done once the Nazi policy of killing all the Jews had been set in motion is incorrect. A lot of people could have done something or, as it were, not done something, with the result that hundreds of thousands of Jewish lives would have been saved. Much of the evidence about killings or denunciations of Jews by peasants in the Polish countryside consists of uncorroborated personal testimony from survivors, their relatives or acquaintances. Typically it is brief, it notes the facts without many details. Much of the time it is second-hand information, for example knowledge that had been sought out and acquired after the fact by a concerned family member. Thus, the body of evidence is not systematic in any sense of the word, and it has um, not been part of any record, so to speak. So strictly speaking, we should abstain from generalizing observations on the basis solely of what we can find about the frequency and distribution of these crimes. To be sure, we can seek a general understanding of these events only because frequency is sufficiently high and distribution sufficiently broad to preclude an easy refutation that these were isolated episodes in strictly confined areas. But the heart of the argument has to be made not by asking what percentage of Polish peasants were hunting down local Jews. We will never be able to provide reliable statistics on this but rather by reconstructing how these murders were conducted. And as a number of detailed narratives exhibit concurring characteristics, we can make a leap towards a general understanding of the phenomenon. It is so because society with a common past and shared customs and institutions has a degree of internal coherence. One should view it as analogous to a text or a system rather than a quilt stitched together from randomly assembled pieces. As a result, practices and attitudes engaging fundamental values, those concerning life and death, for example, must be intelligible beyond the confines of any local community. This is why, even in the absence of firm knowledge about the distribution and frequency of peasant murders of Jews, we can still tell whether they were an accepted social practice from close analysis of a discrete number of episodes. Given the character of these murders, that they were open, well attended and widely discussed public events, and given identity of people involved, that these were regular folks, including members of local elites, a thick description of localized community events yields knowledge about behavior in peasant society at large. Let me now move to the question of plunder, which, as we already know, is intimately related to the killings of Jews by their neighbors. We must be aware, of course, that we are operating at the very end of a long food chain here. Real, massive plunder took place as a result of state action in Western Europe and Germany proper, where Jews were solidly middle class and had substantial wealth which had been taken over through a long process of Aryanization, forced emigration, outright confiscation, and also deportation and killings. Throughout the 12 years of the Third Reich, writes Scholl Friedlander, and I quote him, looting of Jewish property was of the essence. It was the most easily understood and most widely adhered to aspect of the anti-Jewish campaign, rationalized, if necessary, by the simplest ideological tenets." Unquote. Third Reich benefited most from the plunder of Jewish wealth. But Vichy France, for example, tried to get its cut as well. So this is not a uniquely East European story, though the hands-on aspect of it probably is. Mass killings in the Podlasia region, of which the murder in Yedwabne was but one episode, were accompanied by widespread and thorough plunder of Jewish property. It would be more difficult to name townspeople who did not plunder Jewish houses while their inhabitants were being incinerated in a large barn on the outskirts of Radziwiłł, an eyewitness to the murders told the journalist 60 years later. French Catholic priest Father Patrick Dubois, while searching for mass graves of Jews in the Ukrainian countryside and talking to local witnesses, heard from one of his interlocutors, and I quote him, 
One day we woke up in the village and we were all wearing Jews' clothes. Unquote. I am sure the same occurred in numerous localities east of the river Elbe. And things were not much different at the other end of Europe either. When the most ancient Greek Jewish community was deported from Salonika, and I quote now, as soon as they were marched away, people rushed into their houses, tore up floorboards, and battered down walls and ceilings, hoping to find hidden valuables. There was a complete breakdown of order, wrote an official at the time, and the second-hand shops of the city began to fill up with stolen goods, unquote. But again, whether we quote evidence from three or from 33 incidents, we are confronted with a discrete number of episodes, and we remain epistemologically on the ground of anecdotal as opposed to systematic evidence. So in order to overcome the inherently incomplete character of data, we need to keep asking how things were done in order to get a general understanding of what happened. And we can reach such understanding by analyzing in detail the character of the crimes committed, as well as by reading people's minds, so to speak, whenever a record of conversations has been preserved. Let me offer a few examples. In her memoirs, Haya Finkelstein reports how, just as the mass killings were unfolding in her native Radziwiłł, someone suggested that she turn over whatever she still had, since together with her family, she will certainly be killed. And it was only right, Haya's interlocutor argued, without malice, for the good people who knew the Finkelsteins to get these possessions, or else the killers would be rewarded. To a Jewish man trying to find a hiding place with a peasant acquaintance near Wengerów, the latter's son-in-law said matter of factly, since you are going to die anyway, why should someone else get your boots? Why not give them to me so I will remember you? Unquote. Miriam Rosenkrantz had a moment of déjà vu during the program in Kielce, and I quote her, when the horror of the ghetto came back to me, and this scene when I worked with sorting down feathers, and we were about to go back to the ghetto, and they were saying that that's the end, that they were deporting us for sure. And then this Polish woman acquaintance looked at my feet, and the following exchange took place. Really, you could leave me your boots, Missy. But Mrs. Joseph, I'm still alive. Well, I wasn't saying anything, only that those are nice boots, replied Mrs. Joseph. What we are eavesdropping on by listening to these exchanges are truly out of the ordinary ideas. These snippets of conversations are built on an inversion of important principles regulating people's lives in common. The message addressed to a Jewish interlocutor with the expectation of a voluntary surrender of property to a Polish person is embedded in recast understanding of private property rights as well as the norm of goodwill binding people who live in close proximity to one another. Until these conversations took place, we could safely assume that local people viewed the right to private property as inviolable. The only occasion when they felt it might be suspended, in other words, when claims could be made legitimately to surrender what people rightfully owned, would be to relieve extreme hardship which befell on some other members of the community in case of fire or flood or an earthquake, an act of goodwill sustaining reciprocity for times when extreme hardship would in turn fall on themselves. What does it mean that three different people on three different occasions, and one could, of course, quote many more similar exchanges as they caught the attention of Jewish interlocutors and were recorded, express exactly the same very unusual thought about matters of fundamental importance in the life of a community. I find it implausible that such convergence of ideas inverting the meaning of private property and neighborly obligation, as far as the Jews were concerned, was purely coincidental. Again, I am alluding here to the assumption that practices and important beliefs in society are interconnected and must be congruent. In other words, what is accepted as a matter of fact in one of its segments could not be directly negated in another or else people would be experiencing cognitive dissonance. Thus, to my mind, this anecdotal evidence and it would remain anecdotal even if we quoted 10 or 15 such episodes, is an indication of a shift in shared norms concerning acceptable behavior towards the Jews. In the eyes of their Polish neighbors, 
at some point Jews cease to be human beings and were perceived instead, to use the expression coined by Emanuel Ringelblum, a preeminent witness and historian of the Holocaust at the same time, as deceased on holidays, unquote. It may seem that I am grasping at straws here, but it is important to develop ways of argumentation portraying plunder of Jews for what it was, namely a social practice, rather than a criminal or a deviant behavior of some rogue individuals. And that plunder was widespread and sanctioned by norms is revealed precisely by the form of reference to it captured in language. We find an echo of this shift in normative expectations, not only among individuals speaking about interpersonal relations, but in institutional evaluations concerning relationships between groups, such as an early report of the Polish underground sent to London government in exile, indicating that Jews are non-responsive to Polish Catholic fellow citizens' approaches to take their goods, even though it is clear that otherwise everything will only end up in German hands. Evidently, by not consenting to be despoiled by their neighbors, Jews were somehow favoring Germans over Poles. And so the stakes are rising. A recalcitrant Jew unwilling to surrender his or her boots to a Polish acquaintance is not only unfriendly, but implicitly also unpatriotic. Conversely, when retail Jewish commercial property and real estate was ordered by German decrees into Aryan trusteeship, an opportunity for enrichment which was taken up with eagerness by Polish lawyers, for example, this was also defended by suggestions that members of the corporation were rescuing this wealth from German hands, a line which at least the main underground publication, Bulletin Informazione, was not buying as it warned the legal profession in an article of July 19, 1940, that such behavior was objectionable. And since the practice of Aryanization was continent-wide, Poland, as we shall see, that was not the only place where similar arguments had been advanced. Where do we go from here? Let me conclude this discussion of plunder with a few snippets of conversations, uh, followed by views articulated in important underground memoranda. A certain Józef Górski, a well-to-do landowner from central Poland, writes the following about the Holocaust in his memoirs. And I quote, As a Christian, I could not not feel compassion, double negative in the original, with my fellow human beings. But as a Pole, I looked at what was happening differently. I considered Jews to be an internal enemy, so I could not help feeling glad that we are getting rid of this enemy and, what's more, not with our own hands, but thanks to the deeds of another external enemy. I could not hide satisfaction when I rode through our little towns and saw that there were no more Jews. Asked by Turm, a local German official with whom he was on this occasion, do Poles perceive being liberated from the Jews as a blessing? I replied, Gewiss, of course, being sure that I am expressing the opinion of the overwhelming majority of my fellow nationals, unquote. And Gurski was reading the minds of his fellow nationals correctly. Some variation of a ditto, we will have to put up a monument to Hitler for having gotten rid of the Jews, was overheard in private conversation all over Poland. We have testimony to this effect not only from Jews who were successfully passing as Aryans and later recounted what they saw and heard in their wartime milieus, but from numerous Polish witnesses as well. Given such a widespread consensus of opinion, it is no wonder that with the war's end approaching, highly placed functionaries of the Polish underground state advised the government in exile in London about the looming, what else, Jewish problem. The official position of the government had been that all changes resulting from decisions taken by the occupiers with respect to matters involving geographical boundaries, citizenship rights and status, property confiscations, all purported legal changes, in other words, were null and void. But London was warned repeatedly from the home country that the matter was not as simple as it may have seemed. 
return to the status quo ante and resumption by Jews of their economic role from before the war was an impossibility, reported Roman Knoll, the head of the Foreign Affairs Commission in the apparatus of the government delegate. It was underground civilian administration in occupied Poland. The non-Jewish population had taken over Jewish positions in the social structure, he wrote in 1943, and this change is final and, and I quote him now verbally, but in permanent in character. Should Jews attempt to return en masse, rumors and exaggerated estimates circulated about the numbers of Jews who had managed to escape into the Soviet interior and were expected to return to Poland after the war, people would not perceive this as a restoration, but as an invasion which they would resist even by physical means." Unquote. In July 1945, another distinguished politician of the London-affiliated underground, Jerzy Brown, conveyed his observations about the growing anti-Semitism in Poland. And I quote him. Today, there is no place for a Jew in small towns and villages. During the past six years, finally, emphasis in original, a Polish third estate has emerged which did not exist before. It completely took over trade, supplies, mediation, and local crafts in the provinces. Those young peasant sons and former urban proletarians who once worked for the Jews are determined, persistent, greedy, deprived of all moral scruples in trade and superior to Jews in courage, initiative, and flexibility. Those masses will not relinquish what they have conquered. There is no force which could remove them. It was understandable that Jews who survived the onslaught but could not return to their hometowns live ruined and broken, telling the rest of the world that Poles are anti-Semitic. But what they take for anti-Semitism, Brown concludes, is only an economic law which cannot be helped." Unquote. And truth be told, the majority of Polish peasants came into possession of Jewish property because Jews all over Europe and ipso facto in Poland had been killed by the Germans. Some peasants helped their luck and most liked what happened. But their involvement in these crimes was opportunistic. All that I'm arguing for is recognition that when the opportunity arose, they were not shy to take it. I will ask you to turn your attention to the photograph now. This is a familiar image people have seen in countless variations. Peasants at harvest time after work well done, resting contentedly with their tools behind a pile of crops. Some may have taken a snapshot of this kind on summer vacations with distant relatives in the countryside. Others carry it as a souvenir from a scouting expedition helping farmers in the big country bring in their crops. It was regularly splashed every summer across the front pages of newspapers half the world over in communist countries in celebration of yet another bountiful harvest provided by collectivized agriculture. And visitors came upon its more or less artistically refined renditions in painting galleries and museums. Yet, despite belonging to a bucolic genre, people at ease, surrounded by nature, talking to one another, in a moment they will probably burst into singing, this photograph and not just because it's fuzzy, is disquieting. If there were palms protruding from behind the assembled group rather than coniferous trees, one could speculate that it was taken in a desert. Something feels off kilter with the landscape, which cannot be pegged easily to a geographical location. The image strikes the viewer as familiar and strange at the same time. And when one finally notices the crop scattered in front of the group, skulls and bones, no less. The mystery deepens. Where are we? Who are the people in the photograph? And what are they doing? We are in the middle of Europe, just after World War II has ended. In other words, in the middle of the 20th century. And we see in the photograph a bunch of peasants standing atop a mountain of ashes. These are the human ashes of 800,000 Jews gassed and cremated in the Treblinka extermination camp between July 1942 and October 1943. The Europeans captured in the photograph have been digging through the remains of Holocaust victims, hoping to find gold and precious stones that Nazi executioners may have overlooked, despite carefully checking the body cavities of murdered Jews. 
One of the earliest mentions of this phenomenon, together with a few photographs of Treblinka's eerie landscape, came from two fellows who visited the site of the Treblinka extermination camp on September 12, 1945. The entire area, they, they reported, was scarred with holes, several meters deep, with human bones scattered all around. People sifting through the mounds of human ashes didn't bother to answer when asked what they were doing. The area was large, the scale of excavations enormous. Thousands had to have worked to produce this lunar landscape. And I quote now, mutual relationships in the Treblinka area are simply incredible, the authors of the report wrote. People who enriched themselves with gold dug up from the graves by night plundered their own neighbors. We were terrified because in a peasant hut some dozen meters from the house where we spent the night, a woman was tortured with live fire to reveal the place where she was hiding gold and valuables." Unquote. And while the scale of Treblinka excavations was unique, the practice of digging up Jewish remains from the sites of mass murder to strip them of valuables was common. But the plunder of Jewish wealth, the main story illustrated in the photograph, was a continent-wide affair. It took place from the Atlantic Ocean in the west to as far east as German armies reached in their campaign against the USSR, and was accompanied by opportunistic behavior of the local population, despite the locals also being subject to exploitation by Nazi conquerors. In Salonika, and I quote again, Jewish tombstones were to be found in urinals and driveways and had been used to make up the dance floor of a taverna built over a corner of the former cemetery itself because graves had been ransacked for the treasure that had been supposedly hidden there. Many Jewish skulls and bones are visible, unquote. Evidently, peasants from Eastern Europe were not the only ones to act in this manner. In 1943, in anticipation of German defeat, various associations were formed in occupied France to protect the interests of those Frenchmen who had acquired the so-called Aryanized Jewish property. Such associations continued to exist, albeit under new names, after the liberation. They defended their constituencies fiercely against the restitution of Jewish businesses or apartments to their rightful owners. Quote, those who bought Jewish property protected French interests, the associations argues. By buying property that the Germans threatened to liquidate, the purchasers preserved a precious inheritance for the national economy, unquote. Thus framed, stripping the Jews of their assets was cast as responsible and patriotic behavior. Little wonder that in April of 1945, hundreds of demonstrators went to the streets of Paris crying, death to the Jews and France for the French. The few Jews returning to their hometowns after the war from Salonika to Warsaw were made unwelcome by former neighbors already comfortably ensconced in their old apartments and jobs. The story of the plunder of Jewish assets occasionally reaches large circulation press when Swiss banks are challenged to produce lists of dormant accounts or national museums are forced to return stolen Jewish paintings acquired through bona fide art dealers. However, its significance is not in being a momentary focus of journalistic zeal, but the very fabric of what Saul Friedlander identifies as the broad consent to the Nazi organized Holocaust by institutions and people in occupied Europe. And I'm quoting now Friedlander. Not one social group, not one religious community, not one scholarly institution or professional association in Germany and throughout Europe declared its solidarity with the Jews. Some of the Christian churches declared that converted Jews were part of the flock up to a point. To the contrary, many social constituencies, many power groups were directly involved in the expropriation of the Jews and eager, be it out of greed, for their wholesale disappearance. Thus, and this last sentence is emphasized by the author, Nazi and related anti-Jewish policies could unfold to their most extreme levels without the interference of any major countervailing interests." Unquote. Many across the continent have benefited from the Nazi policies stripping Jews of civic and property rights and eliminating them from public life, or rather, as it soon transpired, from stripping the Jews of life altogether. A question and answer to frame this 20th century European cover story, so dramatically illustrated with the picture you see on the screen, could run like this. 
what does a Soviet banker and a Polish peasant have in common? And the answer to this question, only a slight exaggeration, would be a golden tooth extracted from the jaws of a Jewish corpse. Thank you very much. has agreed to answer some questions. Um, can you hear me? He has, has agreed to answer some questions. So um, I hope you have prepared some or are preparing some right now. And uh, if you would just uh, indicate that you have a question, we can do that. Can yeah. you recognize that? Um, Catherine, you mentioned at the beginning how difficult it was for Jews to validate and prove history that what had happened happened. I would like to know a few minutes to us about the present day writers who are writing fictionalized stories about the Holocaust, which to me seems to give ammunition to people who want to believe it didn't happen when it's, when it's framed in a picture of fiction. And one quick other question. Um, what part of history that is not archaeology is not anecdotal. Isn't most history anecdotal by a group or by an individual? Isn't that generally what history is? Uh. Well, you know, evidence in history can be uh, of, of very differing nature. Institutions leave documentation. It's not anecdotal. You can find statistics, for example. Uh, so in that sense, uh, um, my reference here uh, is to um, what a lot of historians have taken a um, very skeptical initially look at personal testimonies as, as uh, statements that were very subjective and uh, just reflecting um, somebody's uh, um, experiences or perhaps uh, figments of imagination. You know, it's very difficult to, to test them against reality, uh, as opposed to institutional, institutional documentation that, uh, that, that is of a different nature. So uh, not all evidence for historians is uh, of an, an anecdotal character. As to uh, fictional writings, uh, I'm all for liberty in the arts, and I don't see any problem with people writing uh, and basically uh, <clears throat> whatever artistically they find inspiring. And, uh, and frankly, a lot of writings about uh, the Holocaust, particularly poetry, for example, uh, which may be grounded in experience, but nevertheless, is a, this is a very subjective, if you wish, and a personalized uh, form of uh, expression, uh, is, uh, is incredibly um, powerful as, uh, uh, as uh, uh, a reminder of what had happened, and, and, and it really allows, I think, future generations to empathize with what has happened. You know, the deniers don't need any evidence uh, or any uh, help in order to um, uh, continue their um, skepticism, if you will. This is, it's, it's not related to what's available uh, <clears throat> out there in the world, so uh, I don't think writers or poets should be blamed for helping out deniers when they write fiction pieces about the Holocaust. Yes. There's a microphone coming to you. Oh, sir. Yes. First, I want to know what, I want to thank you for the last few subjects I'm here about the environment. My name is Jack Graham, and I am a Holocaust survivor. I have been many, many times after the war on the Holocaust. I don't know where you're from, but I, I am from Rather Falls. And you know, the last place I have been in Trevica, in Trevica, the last place I walked around there, and the day I arrived around there, I saw a fair number of the grounds. I'm looking for that word they're looking for. The Jewish gold diamonds, whatever the beauty is. 
very happy. And that's the same thing that's happening to me. And rather, I came into my house, and I wanted to spend a night in my house because my parents had buried some stuff in the outside of the yard. And I wanted to pay for that. You know what I was told? That certain change before. I think anti-Semitism, but the Germans haven't accomplished the Poles, finished with the Jews, which you brought up and gave the environment down. They came back the same as I did after the war from the concentration camp. They got killed by the Poles. You know, so I was told in my house down there, if I don't get out, I'm going to kill them. That's what I was told. And you see, I was together here in America. General Yaroslavsky has invited a group of Polish Jewish people which have survived the war. They had traveled in Poland, but my parents said, my grandparents said, to come and they'd be able to get that property back. Well, I went over down to the pole. In fact, at that time, I already had a business down in America. I was a businessman for 44 years. And I, when I arrived down there, they were very beautifully received. But at that time, on the general side, they sent out some people from the tax department. For that, once as a pole, I truly used to be told. You know what I was told? From 1939 to 1945, Hitler occupied Poland. So the Germans used to collect the rental for the property. And I'm the type of guy, I agree. I'll be going to write down everything. Then later, the communists came. And they collected the rentals. And they, they took the money. Then later, Democracy folded, so they collected the money. They put a price on so much and so much pro unions, and how much I owe the taxes, and I said, I'm willing to pay that. Can I sell the tax? Can I sell the property now? You know what I was told? You can sell the property, but you are not going to be able to tear the money out from Poland. You can get bonds. And that will be redeemable with 25 years from now. <laughs> so, you need to see what, what they did to these people down there. You see, but my is mine, but use is use, but in actuality, what Poland did now to the survivors of the Jews, they stole everything the Jews had that left down there in property. They never ate one dime or ever Thank you very much. Give me an <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I don't have an answer, but uh, obviously you found a very incompetent lawyer because uh, Jews who go there and can identify their property can, can get restitution, and it's in, in Polish Zlotis, and they can exchange Polish Zlotis for dollars anywhere they want. So uh, get another lawyer when you get there, and you'll, you'll be fine. Um, pr prior, prior to the war, uh, one third of Warsaw's population was Jewish, as you know. There were Jewish doctors, Jewish attorneys, Jews throughout the arts. Um, could you comment on the phenomenon of widespread anti-Semitism and the integration of Jews? For example, my, my father-in-law built a business um, making shoes, and all of his employees were non-Jews. He, he would provide them with the leather, they would make the shoes, and he would sell the shoes. He also built buildings and did get some restitution from the Polish government, which made an agreement with the United States after the war, by the way. It wasn't adequate, but there was an agreement. Could you comment on that phenomenon of the rank anti-Semitism in, in the church in the society and the fact that Jews were, to a great degree, well integrated in the society. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you posed the question this way. Uh, of course, there was an anti-Semitism in Poland before the war. Um, 
where and, uh, and 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 the church was anti-Semitic, and it's it was a phenomenon that was just absolutely universal at the time in in Christian Europe or in the United States, uh, for that matter. So uh, there is there is nothing surprising or or, or or unique or particular. You know, the Dreyfus affair is a story that took place in France, very civilized country. Uh, in Romania, there was, uh, thank you very much, enough uh, anti-Semitism for, for Jews to suffer on, on various occasions. So, and so in Hungary as well. So this, this was not uh, anything uh, out of the ordinary, so to speak. And the, the families of a lot of uh, you who are here, I'm sure, uh, those who emigrated, not as a result of the Holocaust, the gentleman uh, came here afterwards, but uh, a long time before, uh, from all over Europe, this was precisely because of these reasons, you know. So, um, at, at the same time, let's not forget that this was a community, a Jewish community in Poland, the largest in the world, really, uh, after... The, the community of Jews in America, who are also in, in their majority made up of emigres from Poland, lived in that country for centuries. And uh, mm, it was a contentious relationship uh, on many occasions. From time to time, there were pogroms, as you know very well. Uh, more often than not, in the context of social upheavals on a grand scale, uh, wars or uh, revolutions, uh, but, uh, but it was a coexistence that uh, functioned. Uh, and, uh, in, and there was, there was a layer within the Jewish community that was uh, fairly well integrated and assimilated as well. Uh, this was uh, the social composition of Polish Jewry was very was different than the social composition of Jewry in West European countries. So this was um, middle class, well integrated, uh, relatively speaking, and um, uh, and willing to be integrated as well. Not as religious as in in Poland, Jews were uh, of a much lower social status uh, and class, much poorer. Except for a, a small layer, as I said, of, of educated and uh, uh, well-to-do Jews, and uh, among them, uh, and the Polish strata of, of middle class, there was quite a, uh, especially on the left of the political spectrum, uh, there was a very kind of a livable modus vivendi. You know, there were lots of assimilated Jews in a Polish Socialist Party, for example. Uh, and uh, Polish uh, and, and Jewish lawyers and, and doctors, uh, as well as um, artists uh, as well, just uh, among the elite, really, uh, and, and formative groups of, of uh, Polish writers and, and poems who were writing in, in, in Polish uh, were people who were of assimilated Jewish background. So there is this space of coexistence, and, uh, uh, but at the same time, um, once the Nazis came in and opened up this uh, uh, horrendous cauldron of uh, um, hatred, uh, anti-Semitism, which was uh, very much part of, the, uh, of life and, and uh, <clears throat> mental outlook of very many people, including, and the church was very vociferous on it, and just started doing its uh, Horrendous work. There, yeah. Um, much, of your, much of your research takes takes place in retelling events that, that occurred 60 to 70 years ago, and I guess I was I was hoping that you might be able to comment a bit on what accounts for the current reluctance of the Polish government, Polish officialdom, to come to grips in any real way with a lot of what it is that it, your research has uncovered. I'm thinking, you know, in the wake of the wall coming down, in the wake of, of all kinds of changes that have occurred in Poland, and in the wake of, of the Polish government's desire to move more into the Western economic sphere and, and into the kind of Western um, philosophical camp, that, that they have a tremendous amount to gain by this. Um, I've heard anti-Semitism as the explanation, and while that's a good blanket explanation, it seems to me that it doesn't give the specifics of the situation. I was hoping you could comment on that. Well, uh, I, I don't know how closely you follow the situation in Poland, but actually the Polish authorities are bending backwards uh, and have been very forthcoming in recognizing 
and acknowledging uh, the fact of anti-Semitism and, and, uh, and uh, um, viewing it as something that's totally unacceptable and, and objectionable. I'll just give you one, uh, one example from, uh, I think, three years ago or four years ago, I don't remember, it's still President Kaczynski was uh, alive. Uh, the chief rabbi of Poland, Mike, Michael Schudrich, uh, who you know, dresses like a, a, a Jewish man, of course, and um, I think he was spat on uh, in, in the street uh, as, as he um, walked by. Um, the next day, he would receive a telephone from the president of Poland, uh, who had learned about this fact, apologizing for it, and there was just incredible manhunt organized by, by the police uh, that was uh, mandated by authorities, and of course, the guy who did it was caught very quickly. Now, it doesn't seem to me that in the United States or, or very many countries in the world you would find uh, this sort of official, if you will, sensitivity and reaction to uh, uh, something uh, of that sort. I mean, so uh, the authorities are very um, sensitive and, and aware of what went on and, and, and so forth. It's, uh, uh, and, and various social medias as well, you know, I'm, uh, I, I'm very proud of what has been happening in the Polish, uh, among Polish historians, for example, who for the last uh, 12 years or so began to write the history of the Holocaust in Poland without any blinkers on their eyes and really saying things, uh, uh, just um, I quoted to you, this is this, uh, the longest and most dramatic quote in, in, in what I had to say today comes is, is authored by two Polish historians and published in Poland, of course, in, in Polish uh, uh, language and in Polish periodicals. So, uh, as far as official attitude is, is concerned, I think uh, it, 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 this is a very um, good case uh, for, uh, um, unlike in, in, in countries further east, Ukraine, Lithuania, for instance, uh, and uh, um, I, I have really very little to reproach. There is, there is a lingering anti-Semitism in the Polish society and, and it manifests itself in a variety of ways. Uh, it's, it's an abstraction because there are no Jews in, living in Poland. Mm, there are very few Jews. Of course, anti-Semites think that there are a lot of Jews and that all the, all the politicians in Poland are Jewish, etc., etc. But um, but um, this is this is a matter for um, I think psychiatrists to to because the, the the lingering prejudice for so long. But Polish church is not very helpful on this on, on this issue, unfortunately. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm a child of uh, Holocaust survivor, and I think that uh, the Holocaust one year before the war ended, and our our history is correlated because I was born in Book of Poland. Let you speak to the microphone. Book of Poland, 13,000 Jews lived over there before the war. There were seven survivors at the end of the war, including two of my parents. And uh, majority of the people in Polish government came from Russia. They were members of the Polish Communist Party because that's the only people, only party would absorb or actually recognize Jewish people. So you had uh, ministers like Jakub Berman, uh, Mensen, and Rokosowski, who was irrational, but they speculated he was Polish. But what, we, what I have observed and studied and still study is after the war, Army Krajowa. Home army went on uh, went on spree to persecute Jewish people, and there was a continuous uh, conflict between NKVD, which in Russian means News Nice Cut of Your News of the Moon. You may understand that, Mr. Cross. And uh, my uncle got killed in one of the battles because they couldn't comprehend that Jews could run government, Polish government, and local governments. The problem in Chief Kelsen uh, happened after the war in 1947. 55 Jews were killed over there. 
So the inherent problem in public society is that the peasants of Huopi were very religious Roman Catholics, and in many cases they listened to the, to the sermons, kill the Jews because they killed Jews. So uh, one would think that antisemitism started in 1354 in Poland, when first then when the king of Poland allowed them to move to Poland so he could collect war taxes so, uh, from them. So antisemitism is still there. I think Poland in the last 15 years Polish people have recognized that it's popular to talk about Jews and Jews struggle with Poland and war. It's popular because it brings foreign exchange. And that's all it is. And I've left that country 50 years ago, and I am not going to this forsaken country ever again. And I have property of my parents, and I don't care. I just want to leave those people where they belong. Thank you. I, I, I don't think this is a question, so you just have a contribution by the gentleman. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, That's all right. We have one more question here. Is that Mike Wright? What was the role played by the church during the Holocaust and after the Holocaust in Poland? Well, the role of the church. What was the role, what was the attitude towards the yes. persecution? The, the role, 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 was there any attitude about restitution after the war? Uh, the, the role of the church was uh, really very uh, harmful because the church, in, in, the best one can tell about the church is that they didn't do anything during the Holocaust about about uh, the uh, what was going on. They did not, in a very in an open fashion as they could have. Uh, condemn or, or uh, called for behavior that, that would lead to assistance to Jews. There were a, a number of individual priests who, who behaved very nobly, of course, um, and particularly a number of women's convents uh, took, are, are well known for taking uh, Jewish children and um, hiding them and preserving and just saving their lives in that manner. But as an institution, the church will behave uh, terribly. Uh, and, and that's very important because, of course, there was, but because there was a church in every village and therefore a, a local priest uh, in every village. And uh, in, the, in the majority of cases, they were uh, um, unwilling to uh, extend any kind of uh, uh, help or or assistant or even or to, or to preach to speak about uh, the horror that was going on. I mean, we we know that the Pope in the Vatican was not um, any better either. So, and after the war, the the, the Church uh, uh, remained um, anti-Semitic in its outlook, and uh, it uh, uh, perpetuated the kind of myth that, that the gentleman described here that about the Jews uh, ruling Poland. This was not the case, but uh, uh, anti-Semites uh, very much wanted to believe in it, uh, that the association between Jews and communism and, and the church, uh, this was the frame of mind of church leaders at, at the time as well. So uh, um, their, their behavior in general, and on specific occasions, for example, such as the Kielce pogrom, was uh, uh, truly um, abominable. Yeah. Now, um, Mr. Sally Belowski um, has a few words to say to help express our thanks to Dr. Gross for his fine lecture today. Wait one minute. We want to thank uh, Jan Gross for being with us today. Um, what I didn't say uh, in my first remarks is, is I didn't thank you all uh, for helping this program become as good as it has over the last 12 years. Your support annually, Friends of the Holocaust Studies Program, is so important to what we're doing, and we want to thank you very much for your continued support. I know many of you have been coming here year after year and supporting us year after year, and because of you, we're able to grow the program offer more courses. Uh, next year, our uh, pr uh, prime um, goal is to offer more scholarships and fellowships 
to the best students to attract them to this program. So I want to thank you for your continued support and for being here today. Um, Dr. Gross's books are going to be on sale. He, if you brought copies you already have, he'll be happy to autograph them for you. Or if you want to purchase a book, he'll be there to uh, autograph it and sign it uh, for you while, while he's here and while you're here. Uh, on behalf of the uh, advisory board and everyone here, we have a, a gift for Dr. Gross to commemorate your being here. It's from Tiffany's. You could tell from the color. Tiffany's, this is... Huh. This is, this is, if, if this is golden, I'm... Uh, it's I'm it's very crystal. Oh, crystal. goodness. Oh, this yeah. is so beautiful. Can Thank you, you very much. Can you read it? The University of Texas at Dallas Ackerman Center for Holocaust Studies, the Burton Einspruch Holocaust Lecture Series, Jan Gross, October 13, 14, 2013. Uh, Thank you.